Welcome, and we thank uh, everyone for tuning in to today's Farm Doc webinar. And this is an, an unusual one. You usually find myself and uh, Todd Hubs talking about the markets. Uh, Going to be different today. The title of the talk today is Farm Doc: The Future of Agricultural Extension. And we're giving this as part of our celebration of the 20th anniversary of Farm Doc this year. And so this webinar today is going to consist of a presentation that I make uh, just talking about the history and development of Farm Doc and then end with a discussion of is this the future of agricultural extension, the title of the of the talk. Um, really glad to also have with me my two colleagues, Todd Hubbs and Gary Schnicke. They're going to uh, offer just some follow-up thoughts and be available uh, during the Q&A part of this webinar uh, to contribute. So I think uh, this will be hopefully interesting and fun. As usual, uh, today, uh, right now, if you're tuned into your GoToWebinar and you have your control panel up, there's a section there for handouts and you can get a copy of all the slides as usual. And the, the slides and the video will be available tomorrow at the FarmDoc uh, webinar site listed on the screen. And as usual, please submit any questions during the presentation and we'll do our very best to get uh, to as many of them as we can. So I want to start with a discussion of what we do in FarmDoc, because that's the overall picture that we need to understand the development of this thing that we've called FarmDoc. What we do is really pretty straightforward. We do traditional Corn Belt farm economics, topics like ag finance, marketing and outlook, farm management. Uh, you can see commodity policy, crop insurance, and uh, something relatively new, biofuels, markets, and policy. But that's something that's really important to understand FarmDoc. We've had a well-defined mission or vision of the topics and subject matter that we cover from the very beginning. In fact, about 15 years ago, some of us, including Gary Schnitke, who's here today, wrote an article called The FarmDoc Project, This is Still Your Father's Extension Program. And we chose that title because even though our dissemination model might be changing, the what, in terms of what we research, do analysis, and provide uh, educational programming, the area has never really changed. And in fact, while our methods have changed for distributing our analysis, it's really considered driven by what I think is the original vision of extension. There's a, a famous quote from a person called Seaman Knapp, who's kind of the father of extension. And he said, what a man hears, he may doubt. What he sees, he may possibly doubt. But what he does himself, he cannot doubt. And this quote summarizes the idea of demonstration being at the heart of and in the DNA of doing extension work as it's been conceptualized for the last hundred years. And here's just an example of the way um, demonstration can be applied to what we do in FarmDoc. For example, here was a uh, article uh, by Gary Schnitke and co-authors uh, entitled Prevented Planting Decision for Corn in the Midwest. This uh, was a widely uh, distributed article in mid-May as we were going through prevent plant decisions here uh, in much of the Corn Belt and other parts of the country. And this article talked about prevent plant decisions and what uh, went into making those decisions this year as a result of the really unprecedented wet spring that we had. And talked about, gave examples, things that a farmer could mull over, consider, analyze compared to their own situation. It's exactly demonstration. But we've also often gone the further step. Uh, on the right of the screen, you can see output from a uh, fast spreadsheet tool that Gary and his colleagues developed where a farmer could go and basically play with the numbers themselves. This is the heart and soul of demonstration in the classic meaning for extension 
And I would argue that that's been at the heart of what we do in FarmDoc from the beginning. So it's an important point to recognize that the subject matter and the problems that we address in FarmDoc are the traditional problems of commercial agriculture here in the U.S. Corn Belt centered in Illinois. So with that as a background about what we do, it's important to now talk a little bit about how did FarmDoc develop? We need a little historical context to uh, understand that. We're going back to the 90s for a few minutes. And here's some highlights uh, for those of us that are around can remember, you know, just tremendous innovation and change uh, was really revolutionary with the uh, internet. Now we just call it the web. And these are just some of the things that were going on in the 90s. So there was just a real revolution going on in the 1990s in terms of uh, digital technology. But at the same time, what we experienced here at the University of Illinois was uh, some really serious budget cuts in extension, program reorganization, job losses. You know, we basically were, you know, what we experienced was uh, just a, a tremendous cutback in uh, the extension system within Illinois. So at, what we were faced with uh, inside the Department of Agriculture and Consumer Economics was a rather stark choice. Uh, given the extension cutbacks that were going on, we could basically close up shop and do something else, or we could try a different model that could adapt to the substantially diminished extension resources that um, we could see going that were happening in the 90s and we didn't think that that trend would change so we decided to try something else and we were fortunate that here at the university of illinois it was already a center for innovation uh, on the web in the 1990s uh, the real precursor to farm doc was something called stratsoy uh, which was a project uh, with the United Soybean Board to just put things up on the web. That led to something called the Strategic Research Initiative in Information Systems and Technology, or the ITSRI as we knew it, knew it from something called CIFAR, uh, which was a strategic uh, research initiative to increase funding for agricultural research. And we were very fortunate that that was rolling out just at the time as we were trying to figure out what that something else might be um, to help us serve commercial agriculture in Illinois. And that was the initial funding that got us going and trying to figure out what we could do like Stratsoy, uh, but directed to what we would just call traditional commercial agriculture, uh, agricultural economics programming. So a group of us got together, and in 1999, we produced FarmDoc version 1.0. We didn't call them versions at the time, but that's what we uh, called them. Uh, and as you can see, this is a pretty limited website by today's standards. Uh, and in fact, uh, our first website was not even called iGro. It was called, uh, it wasn't called FarmDoc, it was called uh, iGro. Uh, Illinois Grain Risk Outreach. We soon decided we need a little bit more imaginative title than that and came up with farm.doc, borrowing from the dot com revolution at the time. And that stands for Farm Decision Outreach Central. So now you see the word farm doc, you, you know where that came from. Well, this was a pretty bare bones operation. It was really just a collection of already existing uh, websites and not any real integration. And so that kind of launched us into thinking about where to go next. And in 2000, we re released FarmDoc, what I call version 2.0. And this is for most people would be where they would have had their first interactions with FarmDoc. Uh, and this was a really significant 
step in the evolution of the history of farm doc because the first thing that we realized is if you looked at our first website it's a testament to uh, the lack of creative design skills of agricultural economists so we knew we needed to get better and we hired an outside web designer uh, and we were very fortunate to use this person uh, chuck mckenna for many years and this is his handy work and it was a great site uh when he first designed it for us and, and that basic de design was used for many years so we put ourselves in the hands of a professional web designer and th that was a very important step but there was also something that was equally profound going on behind the scenes and that had to do with how we organized ourselves within the department to produce FarmDoc. And I will set this up by way of contrast. Here's a uh, schematic of what I call uh, before FarmDoc, the high touch extension model. This is the traditional form where you have a state extension specialist, district specialist, county extension agents, clients who might be farmers and others, and basically the information and programming flowed up and down uh, uh, through that network of people. We saw the opportunity for a new model that I'm for now calling a digital model, where the centerpiece is the farm doc website in other words it's a digital first or web first model where you put all publications databases tools everything goes on the web first and this is uh the interface for the farm doc team and uh the clients being farmers and others and then you would see interaction then from the clients to the farm doc team based on what was put up on the website. So we realized this opportunity, and so we reorganized ourselves into a team that basically was pushing digital content. Now, one point that I want to make that's very important is that the FarmDoc team uh, has never been or the farm doc project has never been entirely strictly speaking a digital approach or model we have always conducted uh, a number of traditional face-to-face -face meetings here's a picture from one a series that we do every december of five regional meetings in illinois uh, attended typically by around 800 people then individual members of the farm doc team probably do, do um, around 200 meetings a year and in fact as the farm doc effort has become more prominent and more influential we have found a tremendous growth in the demand for face-to-face uh, -face meetings where we're making presentations uh, so in reality farm doc has always been kind of a mixed model uh, where we, in essence, are a, at the centerpiece is a digital um, set of materials and programs that we're talking about mainly today. But around that is also a tremendous amount of traditional face-to-face -face meetings, but these generally have occurred outside of the traditional extension uh, service. So that's the um, mixed model that's really at the heart of FarmDoc. 2003, we updated to what I'm calling FarmDoc version 3.0. This was in recognition during our first few years. We found out that uh, publications uh, were um, our most popular materials, so we reorganized the site to make finding those publications easier. But it was also the first time that we began a sponsorship program as we realized that we needed to be able to think about and figure out uh, how to generate the funding support that we needed to keep this project going in the long run. And so after a lot of discussion, we came up with what I we call a um, public radio or television sponsorship model. And uh, it's worked pretty well for us and we continue it to this day. 
Well, after 2003, we thought we were keeping up and then this happened. Uh, the smartphone revolution really changed everything. Um, and then about the same time, we had a blogging revolution going on and just the demand for information analysis just sped up at an incredible rate. It took us a while to react, but we did in 2011 by developing the Farm Doc Daily website, which had the truly revolutionary concept of a daily newspaper where we committed to write as a team one original article of analysis related principally to Corn Belt Farm economics each and every business day of the year. Uh, this was uh, quite a revolutionary idea when we started it in 2011. And as you'll see later, I think it's been, um, you know, highly successful. Well, coming on the heels of that smartphone and uh, blogging revolution, the next revolution was the development of social media, certainly related, especially to the smartphone revolution. And in response to that, in 2016, I'm calling it FarmDoc 5.0, where we made major investments in social media. We hired a social media manager for the FarmDoc project, shown here, Keith Good, and also uh, began offering a website called Farm Policy News and generally really upgraded our social media activity and i'm happy to report that that's that's gone uh very well as as well finally we get to 2019 what i call farm doc 6.0 which is really just emerging and this is fundamentally a video revolution um, youtube uh, has led the way and we have been doing webinars for a while and now we're investing in doing that in a more permanent way by hiring a, a video and webinar manager for the project. So this is still <clears throat> rolling out, trying to figure out exactly what, <clears throat> excuse me, exactly <clears throat> what this will all entail. But that's that's kind of the frontier of where we are today. And these six different versions are the way that I would summarize uh, the development of the farm doc project so how can we measure the success of farm doc you've seen the development you know what we do are we very good at it and this has been a challenge because the metrics traditionally used to evaluate extension programs all revolve around face-to-face -face meetings and like i said we do do a lot of face-to-face -face meetings still but with a digital uh model with web and these different social media and video at the center of what we do it requires some new measures of success and that means different measures of what are called uh, web statistics and the one that we probably pay most attention to are the number of visitors to our websites as a measure of demand for what we're doing and this chart shows the unique visits to the farm doc farm doc daily and farm policy news websites from 2002 through 2018 and you can see the blue is farm doc red farm doc daily the black is farm policy news and you can see that uh, usage of the uh, traditional legacy farm doc site peaked about one and a half million visitors per year in 2007 and then began to recede somewhat, but still a million visitors by traditional standards is a huge number. And then you can see when we added Farm Doc Daily that we experienced truly explosive growth in the number of users uh, of our websites, uh, topping 3 million visits uh, in each of the last three years. And to give you an idea of what that traffic means, 
That means that we have over 8,000 visitors per day, each and every day through the year uh, to our three websites. So the volume of the uh, traffic to our sites is, is quite large and has been growing over time very rapidly. Some more information about the nature of the visits to the FarmDoc websites um, is shown in this chart. This is just for 2018 and just for FarmDoc Daily, just for presentation purposes. We get traffic to our websites from almost every country in the globe. Uh, but of course, not surprisingly, it's concentrated in the U.S. with 83% of the visits in 2018 to Farm Doc Daily uh, from U.S. locations and non-U.S. locations about 17%. So it is uh, reasonable to conclude that the Farm Doc Project truly has a global footprint. We can also drill down to just the United States and. Again, at the beginning, I talked about this being a um, Corn Belt farm economics program. And if you look at the Corn Belt states, that's where we get a little bit over half of our usage. And But it's very interesting that we do get heavy usage uh, in a number of other states uh, around the country. And a total, uh, Illinois represents about 20% of our total usage in the United States. Here's a different way, trying to get closer in this table to the kind of metric for evaluating face-to-face -face, uh, contacts in traditional extension programs, counting up what I call digital contacts for FarmDoc for the five years between 2014 and 2018. And here, instead of counting visits, we're simply counting each time someone requests a page at a website that registers in the columns for website page requests. And notice that these are all measured in millions. So in 2018, there were 4.4 million requests for a page at the FarmDoc website, 15.9 million page requests at FarmDoc Daily, and 6.6 .6 million at Farm Policy News. I also add to that uh, from our uh, recent investment in Twitter. A Twitter impression means you've just viewed a tweet. And you can see that that has really grown explosively uh, in the last couple of years. And in 2018, we had 14.4 million Twitter impressions for uh, FarmDoc-related Twitter feeds. If you total all those up, uh, you can see we started in 2014 with a total of 12 million digital contacts growing to 41.2 million digital contacts in 2018. And so the bottom line is, you know, these are huge numbers. Um, it's not exactly clear how to compare them to traditional metrics, uh, but I think it's safe to say that, you know, we have huge usage of what we do at FarmDoc. Here's a slide showing just very recent data on views on YouTube, showing that this is, now we're gonna to have to expand our evaluation in the future uh, to track what we're doing in webinars, like we what we do today and other forms of video. We have also done some traditional evaluation. In 2014, FarmDoc was uh, named as one of two institutions to provide educational education and uh, decision tools to help farmers make decisions that they needed to as a result of the 2014 Farm Bill. And so, uh, as I cite here, I, there was an article published in 2017 that reported the results of a formal survey across the US uh, to assess um, the effort that uh, University of Illinois, FarmDoc, and Texas A&M uh, made in providing these decision tools. And what I've uh, highlighted here in the red box is just uh, showing that there was great awareness of these tools. You see two thirds of the people surveyed were aware of these two 
tools on a national basis, which is quite high. And we also did uh, ask questions that allowed us to estimate how much someone would be willing to pay for access to the tool uh, if they were hypothetically um, going to pay for access to the tool. That turned out to be $7.32, which is not that large for an individual visit, but given that there were hundreds of thousands of people that needed to make these decisions, uh, that would add up to a very relatively high value. So that's more of a traditional way that you would evaluate uh, the economic value of something that's associated with the farm dog project. Another way to uh, think about uh, the success of farm dog are awards and recognition. One of the things that I can say personally I'm uh, very proud of is the fact that uh, the farm doc team has won three distinguished group extension awards from the Agricultural and Applied Economics Association, which as far as I know is unprecedented. And you can see on this slide a number of our awards and recognitions that we have received uh, as a as a indicator of the success of what we have done in building FarmDoc. So I now want to talk about, you know, if you accept that it's been a successful effort, which hopefully uh, that seems a reasonable conclusion after the data I've uh, just presented, you know, what do we see as the keys to that success? The first uh, is a talented team. Uh, we have a 16-member farm doc team of faculty and staff subject matter specialists, 12 from Illinois, three from Purdue that regularly uh, contribute, and one from Ohio State. Um, the individuals on this team have a variety of extension teaching and research appointments. Um, it might surprise a lot of people, but here at Illinois, uh, we've managed this uh, effort with only having funding for 1.9 FTEs, FTEs formerly through the extension system. That's the, the numbers, but the key point is you can have all the bells and whistles and be at the cutting edge of digital technology, but if you don't have the talent and the knowledge power to produce the analysis and the, write the articles and conduct the meetings that people want uh, to help them make decisions, you know, all those fancy bells and whistles don't matter a bit. And so we've been, you know, extraordinarily fortunate here at the University of Illinois with some help from friends from uh, a few other universities to really have uh, a team of exceptional individuals, and that's the talent. So if you don't have the talent, you don't have the specialists that are producing the knowledge and analysis that that people have a demand for, then you you don't get to first base. The second key to success uh, is a shared vision. And we've been fortunate from the start that the people uh, assembled and uh, joined together under the farm doc umbrella, all have a passionate interest in what I talked about earlier, Corn Belt Farm Economics. And so that's, you know, defines what we do and we all share that vision of uh, that's the purpose to serve the commercial agriculture sector first in Illinois and more broadly speaking in the U.S. Corn Belt. Um, how do you get that shared vision? Um, we've just been fortunate to have those kind of people around the University of Illinois. It's probably no accident that the bulk of the, the faculty involved in uh, the team uh, grew up on farms. It's not a requirement by any means, but that certainly helps to provide a unifying and shared vision for the team. Of course, money is always a necessary and required 
element of any putting together a project like this. I mentioned it uh, early in my presentation, but we were very fortunate to pro uh, have provided in our first five years, $300,000 of startup funding through the uh, Strategic Research Initiative of CIFAR. And that's really what got us going. Uh, if you're gonna have a program like this, you have to have a significant chunk of startup funding. And then after our startup funding, uh, we basically kind of proof of concept got ourselves going. Uh, University of Illinois Extension uh, stepped up and provided some funding. And then I'd mentioned we have a sponsorship program. Our current set of main sponsors are shown on the right of this screen, and they now provide very important funding for the project. Give you an idea of some specifics. Here's a, a rough current budget for uh, the Farm Doc project. We have five staff members now, uh, two full-time and three half-time. And th that budget is roughly a quarter of a million dollars for our Farm Doc staff. And you can see right now uh, roughly how that is paid for through sponsorships, our extension funding, um, endowments, and then uh, grants uh, over time. Uh, obviously, this is a major part of keeping this kind of project going is you have to have that base funding and this, this is how we do it. The fourth key to success, I think might be surprising to most people and I just simply call it freedom. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, to be able to experiment early on with developing this what I've called digital model without having any constraints for within the uh, College of ACES here, our own department, and uh, got a lot of encouragement from people. And that, that was really a critical element um, to the development of the project. If you're going to have this digital first kind of model, you have to be able to adjust and try things and basically be flexible and adapt um, at a speed that is difficult to do when you're dealing with a lot of administrative overhead and bureaucracy. And so I think the freedom to innovate has been, you know, very important in our success. And our fifth key to success is what I call uh, low overhead. As I mentioned early on, we were faced in the, by the late 90s, with a situation where we were having dramatic cutbacks in funding through extension. And if we were going to continue to provide traditional extension kind of content to commercial agriculture in Illinois, that we would have to have other faculty who do not have extension appointments uh, have significant involvement in the project. And if you're gonna do that, you have to have what I call low overhead. You have to minimize the overhead time costs to team members. And as a consequence, we adopted a decentralized flat management structure. And because as I mentioned previously, we want to maximize flexibility and speed of response in what we do as problems arise. And here's the best example of that put into action that I can come up with is how we operate in FarmDoc Daily. Most people are very surprised to find that we have no formal editorial review system for FarmDoc Daily, even though we're producing an article every day. That means that individual team members who write the articles are 100% responsible for quality control. Now, having said that, it's not like that there's not without any review, right? <laughs> we all know I use the word crowdsourcing. I mean, when you put an article out on Farm Doc Daily and it's read by, you know, almost instantly thousands of people, trust me, if you got something wrong, you'll hear from people very quickly. So there's a, uh, uh, a uh, reinforcing uh, review mechanism that's definitely in place. Um, so how do we organize ourselves for Farm Doc Daily? Uh, we have a group calendar app and individuals sign up and you go. And that's how it happens. 
Now, what that does require is a very high trust level within the team that when somebody signs up and agrees to write an article in Farm Doc Daily, we all have trust that that's going to be at, up to the quality standards that we expect. So uh, that's something that that we have to sometimes talk about within the team. And but everybody has to know that they have a major responsibility to um, carefully consider what they're they're writing. So now let me get to in the last part of my comments uh, is FarmDoc the future of extension, maybe more specifically agricultural extension at least. So let me, I wanna just talk about what I see as the strengths and weaknesses of the two uh, extension models that I, I talked about earlier. First, what I call the traditional high touch extension model, which has been around for a hundred years and has uh, a tremendous record of success. Its strengths are a network of professionals on the ground, programming is local and need oriented, uh, research and results and recommendations can be customized, feedback from local to the state level and vice versa, and certainly something uh, very noteworthy is that it's traditionally been a very strong network for generating political support to continue uh, the work of the system. That system also has some weaknesses. Uh, uh, with so many people involved, it's expensive. Uh, it can have large administrative hierarchy and overhead cost. Uh, I would say it has had difficulty adjusting to the changing structure of agriculture and also some difficulty in attracting staff with the relevant knowledge of, in particular, agricultural business decisions for commercial operations. So that's just kind of a comparison of what I see as strengths and weaknesses. This can be contrasted with what I'm calling the digital extension model, if you like, the farm doc model. What are its strengths? Um, it has a, it's a cheap method of disseminating information and analysis by comparison, a lot fewer people involved. It's not limited by geography or political boundaries. Uh, as I just talked about, it has minimal administrative overhead. Uh, it's very quick uh, and adaptable to responding to problems as they arise. We can be flexible. It's what I call easy plug and play. If we need to add a new area uh, and if we have the person uh, in a faculty position to provide that content, you just plug them in and you go. What are some weaknesses? Uh, it's probably more difficult to deliver educational programming than a traditional face-to-face -face high touch model. Uh, the feedback from and to the local level can be more limited. Uh, it's definitely more difficult to garner in-state political support without that uh, in-place network in the state, and there is less visibility for state specialists. So the question that I think is most relevant is not either or, is, uh, uh, is the high touch or the digital model correct, but I think, you know, how can these models be blended going forward? And I think we've actually done a lot of that, uh, in fact, uh, with FarmDoc. First off, I think it's reasonable to say that the digital model is a, not a natural fit with high-touch extension model. It's disruptive in a technological sense because the digital model is not limited by state borders or extension hierarchy. And so it's just not exactly clear how this can fit together. The strength of the digital model is flexible and cheap dissemination of information and analysis, but the weakness of the digital model is delivering educational programs and local networking. So if a blended model is to be the future, which is what I think um, is the likely best path, we're gonna have to figure out how to uh, blend and emphasize the strengths of each of these two different models. So, and in blending these models going forward, uh, I wanna talk about some challenges as I end my comments. Number one, it's very interesting if the, the research that's available shows that uh, farmers, landowners, or traditional stakeholders still have a strong preference for face-to-face -face meetings. 
this is from the same article that I sh shared about willingness to pay for our, our uh, farm bill tools. And you can see that in-person meetings are strongly uh, most preferred by farmers and landowners in this particular evaluation. I think that probably will change over time as uh, our traditional audience gets used to uh, things like webinars and video material that's online. There's probably some age component to this as well, but it is a fact of life. Uh, a second challenge is what I call funding for state extension specialist positions. Tenure track extension state specialists are the core of the farm doc team, at least as I think people would think of a traditional extension state specialist. Um, they are the formal connection to the extension system. They maintain the network of personal relationships with ag producers and organizations. I like to think of them as the eyes and the ears on the ground. And in a digital farm doc style uh, model, they are less visible at a local level under that digital extension model. A third challenge is funding project infrastructure, which I've mentioned a couple times. Our current staff and other projects now total $250,000 a year. Um, it has a definitely a challenge to struggle together, to struggle to piece together this funding on a consistent basis. And you can see the three places that we have uh, put that funding together to date. One of the issues with funding a project like this is that the benefits of FarmDoc are actually diffused over a huge geographic area, so there are very large spillover benefits outside of Illinois. Uh, as I mentioned, only 20% of our total number of visits to the project uh, come from in uh, Illinois, yet we're funding it on an Illinois basis. Challenge number four, changing skill set for state extension specialists. I summarize the skill set needed into a high touch extension model as a state specialist that can carry the room. In other words, they are great in face to face meeting settings. In the digital extension model, I summarize it as you need somebody who's an obsessive writer and analyst because the focus is really on written content. And so one of the issues I think for the digital model is that in this system, state specialists can drift toward maybe too much of an academic focus. I think we've done a great job of avoiding that in the farm doc, but you can see when the incentives are writing and doing analysis that that, that could, could be a challenge. So that's the end of my formal comments. I'm gonna now turn this over to my colleagues for a couple minutes of uh, of comments and reactions that they might have, and then we're going to get to your questions. So if you have questions that have come up as a result of the uh, my presentation, please uh, start submitting those. Gary, why don't you take it off because you're one of the originals. Yeah, I'm Gary Schnitke. I've been here since 1998. And I got here at the University, I'm gonna, just going to put FarmDoc in a personal perspective. When I got here in 1998, uh, we were wondering if the University of Illinois Extension would last two more years. <laughs> Actually, it was a very, 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 very difficult time, obviously, and administrators <clears throat> had to do what they had to do. Um, I, over the, if we wouldn't have had FarmDoc, I would have not been as productive or as influential, if you want to look at it that way, as I have been, because it provided me a way to reach all of you on this webinar and uh, many, many, many more. I currently, like Todd next to me, write a weekly farm economics. And actually, I think that that appears on uh, FarmDoc on Tuesdays. So give you a commercial, always come on Tuesdays and listen to what I have to say. <laughs> then you can, uh, you can decide whether I'm the best in the world or uh, not all so good that day by, by reading that. But uh, that has really really help me focus because writing is important writing uh, makes you think through things that things that that you say that are smart look much less smart when you put them on in words so uh, words really help things 
I work hard at those uh, farm weekly farm economics, and that's it's sort of interesting. You get through Tuesday, you get it submitted. And if you're not thinking next Wednesday, what your next Tuesday one is, you're behind. So that <laughs> that that, that, is, that is one of the things that uh, happens here. But I uh, I appreciate what FarmDoc has given me, and I particularly appreciate our listeners and and readers. And I do want to say thank you for all the complimentary things you've said over time and the critiques. The critiques and questions that I've had posed to me in emails and in-person meetings often serve as what's the next writing or what Farm Doc Daily's weekly farm economics often represent those. So it's been a good, good, good ride for me. Uh, Just a reminder, we have a Friday uh, celebration service here. So if you're coming to town, be sure to say hi. And Todd? It's up to you. Uh, I'm Todd Hubbs. Uh, I write the weekly commodity outlook. It's on Monday, so I'm right before Gary. And uh, Gary didn't mention it, and this goes along with the video thing. I think we both started doing videos with our stuff, and I've got some decent feedback on that. So we're always evolving. I think that's true. I've been here a little over three years now, so I'm one of the few people on the team and maybe one of the few people in the country that was a consumer is now a producer of farm talk <laughs> content, and it's been fun. Now, I always wanted to be an extension economist, and I still enjoy going out and talk to people, particularly farmers. You know, if you ask me in the state of Illinois to come and talk and I can do it, I show up. And I know Gary and I both do quite a few meetings, so, you know, it's good to talk about farm doc as a digital platform and that weekly writing Gary's right. You know, I took over for Daryl good, who I think it's safe to say was a legend in commodity outlook in Illinois. And he told me, you know, this thing comes around twice a week and it does. You're, <laughs> you're consistently <laughs> trying to think about what to write. And at times it's a grind. And just like Gary, I get a lot of feedback from your delusional to nice job. And <laughs> I appreciate all of them. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's been exciting to be a part of the project. I enjoy what I do. And, you know, I think one of the things I've noticed about Farm Doc, and I've inculcated this in my work as well, is, you know, we're always trying to improve and get better and learn and evolve. And I, I think you'll see that from Farm Doc moving forward. Well, thank you very much, uh, both of you. So now we've got. Uh, uh, few minutes to answer questions and uh, keep those coming in. We've got time to cover several. I'm going to start with this one and I'll read the question and then uh, we can all jump in on each one of those. I'd like to hear everybody's uh, points. Um, This question says, if FarmDoc is the future of agricultural extension, how will it address commodities grown in other regions of the U.S.? For example, cotton, rice, almonds, pecans, peanuts, oranges. Are you do, or you do you mean that the farm doc model may be the future of ag extension overall? So that, it's a really interesting question. If if you accept our hypothesis that this is at least a good model to consider going forward, um, would we expand farm doc to other commodities, or what would we expect? What do you guys think? So uh, if you're you're looking at extension services. Any, any sort of topic in extension and agriculture in specific, and you're not on the web, you got a problem, right? If you're not, if, you're, you're, if your information is not available in a web-based form, you have a problem because you're, you're not going to be influential. I mean, there's, there's no other ways about it. You, you, you have to have that platform. Now, I think we at FarmDoc, if we could not conceivably do anything but corn belt agriculture because we don't know anything but <laughs> but corn belt agriculture i could talk about cotton all you want but um, uh, i do i do uh, want to know about almonds i really I, love almonds almonds, almonds yeah almonds I'm, would be fun if i was going right, to do something new yeah, that's what i want to do Gary. Uh, yeah I'm, I'm but i'm sure an almond producer would find limited value <laughs> reading, reading what i what, what yeah. i have to say so i think i think all um, or i think we have to have region we have to have a southern farm dock, a western farm dock, a California farm dock, and several other farm docks around around the around the nation. Because there's no way that we 
in farm doc could do anything but corn Maybe, and soybeans. Yeah, and then I, I just jumped on this on on that point. Go back to what I think you know. The success of farm doc is the people that are involved in the team. You know, if we didn't have the talent, the expertise, what I like to call knowledge power, um, you know, nothing happens. And so that means if you want to apply this model elsewhere, you have to build up the team first. Now, maybe that can be a multi-university effort. That's certainly possible. With this technology, it can be done. But it would mean that some walls within the extension system would have to be knocked down. Although we are a multi universe we have we have people from Purdue. We Thank have, you, Purdue. Boiler makers, we're gonna come and beat you this year. Uh, so <laughs> just just so you know that. Um, and uh, Ohio State too. So so we, we we have tried to do that, but if you're gonna, you know, I could see a, a if you really wanted to reform work in commercial agriculture in the country as a whole, you need to go to a system of kind of regional farm docks. Uh, but there would have to be a funding model that would go along with that. So um, I don't uh, know if you have a comment on that. Yeah, I think Todd? it's important. We're ag economists. There's more to extension than just agricultural economics. That's hard to believe. I know it is hard to believe. You know, I mean, you think extension writ large, you know, you've got agronomists and animal scientists and ag engineers and entomologists. And I think there's a place for this kind of model in those spaces as well. I mean, if you're focusing just on agricultural economics, I think Scott's right and Gary's right. There's a place for this kind of um, uh, model uh, moving forward. Okay. Um Enough on that one. Uh, the question has come in. Can you give an example of putting agronomic infor information in interaction via farm doc type platform? You guys got any thoughts on? Well, it's possible. And you, I guess you, em Emerson Napsinger's articles are on the web all the time, right? Yeah, they, they have a, um, uh, the bulletin here at the University of Illinois. And then we, we have some, uh, articles from the um, crop science team on farm doc now. So um, I guess it just in visualizing that you would have to have the same thing. It starts with the team of people who agree to apply the digital model to their work. You know, there's one website uh, or a couple and that they develop the infrastructure to put tools. I mean, it seems like agronomy is almost easier to visualize a farm doc model with the idea of demonstration. You know, they have to bring the results from their field work onto the web, but, you know, they're, they, they have a long history of developing decision tools and applying that demonstration. So I, I think it could be done, but you just have to be organized and um, some of the young, some of the younger, younger, <laughs> Younger than you and I, Gary. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> extension faculty and crop sciences are doing that. So as we move forward, they'll likely ach uh, achieve something along that lines. Yeah. I don't have anything, Todd, you want to add on that one? No, I mean, it's going to be up to the individual departments and the people in them, basically. So here, here's what I, we got to handle. Tobbs Hubs has uh, had a long introduction, two years. Credibility will be even more critical in the future. I'll, I'll agree with that, Todd. You've got to maintain your credibility yeah. move, moving into the future. Yeah. I mean, I'm always working on getting better, folks. I, I really do try. Um, I don't know if it's a long introduction or I've been here a little over three years this week. Oh, it doesn't and, seem that long. And I showed up longer. this September three years ago, and Daryl retired that next January. Okay. So I wouldn't say it was a long introduction, but there's a lot of information imparted in that introduction. It is very important. Yeah. So let's tackle this question. So if this is the future going forward, who is going to fill your shoes? University is not willing to invest in extension. And you were 
you all were known from the high touch era? That's a good question. That's a very good question. That, that does apply to Gary and I. Uh, Todd, that, that's not, uh, you know, doesn't really apply to you. You're, you're new. Newer. But, uh, newer, yeah. Uh, newer model. Uh, I think that uh, that is strategically the main issue that we face here at the University of Illinois and anywhere else that wants to build this model. As I've emphasized over and over, team, 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 talent, talent, talent. You have to have that team and talent in place. And we continue to work very hard at that. And uh, with the uh, cooperation of our uh, uh, extension administrators and uh, college leadership here, we're working at it. But it is a major strategic issue, not here, not just here at Illinois. Uh, so. Uh, you have to have the people or nothing's going to happen. Yeah, and, 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 and the other thing that I would, would say is if you're an, ex, an extension appointment, you, are, you, you will have a digital platform, but somehow you have to meet their, your clientele. And how you do that, you can go out and talk to them, but it's a very important to get to know, uh, know your clientele. And, uh, and so as a younger people move in and they think about a digital future, that still doesn't mean that you're not going to be getting to know your clientele. The farmers, the commodity groups, the farm bureaus of the world, farm credit, all those uh, organizations that you have to develop contacts with and, and, and know those people and understand their concerns. So, and yeah, extension is, we'll have the perpetual problem of scarce resources putting those into extension and um, you know there's always seems to be amongst uh, university admi administrators this desire to follow what's hot at the time now it's digital agriculture well you still need sort of a farm management specialist to understand those so you know that that that's always that's always going to be a struggle Todd anything you want to add on that not really I I like getting out and talking to groups, and I think for an extension specialist, you'll learn as much as you give a lot of times when you go out and talk. Mm -hmm. I love talking to farmers, mainly like the kind of, I love answering questions and the kind of questions you get sort of give you an indication of what people are thinking about. Um, sometimes, you know, I answer every email I get, I answer every phone call I get, but a lot of times in farmers in particular, they'll talk to you in person. And I think that's important. So here's a comment that came in. Todd's question comments somehow got separated from the whole question and going forward. I was trying to put out Daryl had done a great job of setting up the transition. And we have the utmost regard and utmost respect for Daryl. Good. He uh, was one of our great colleagues. And yes, he did do that. Yeah. And that is important. Uh, that, um, you know, in, in taking over these kinds of positions, there's a, there is a transition. And we're, Daryl did a great job of kind of preparing the way for Todd. And that, that helps a lot. It's a, an important part of it. Uh, let's see. Uh, this uh, question said, congratulations on FarmDoc's success and longevity. Can you reflect on the technical complexity of FarmDoc content and its popular success? What do you think that's asking? That's a good question as well. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and, and obviously, we, well, the ability to analyze data uh, is becoming greater all the time, I guess. Um, and the ability to collect data has become greater all the time. I would, would say that as you look at the evolution of FarmDoc, just look at our tool development. We started out 20 years ago compiling fast spreadsheet tools, and now we're working with NCSA on, on tool development and things of that nature. So we're continuing to evolve. I don't know where these technologies are going to take us or where they're going to go, but we'll evolve with them as we, 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 we get, get going through there. Um. Let's see, another one uh, says, thank you for the compliment. Great presentation. Where would you say 
the other universities are in the digital first mindset. Can you compare yourself to the others? So we can compare ourselves to others, and admittedly, this isn't fair. So just just take that in mind. I guess the the one comparison I would make is to Iowa. Iowa has a very good extension program, and it has invested a lot in field personnel. They still have a whole cadre of very good district farm management specialists, which would be masters or higher level of uh, personnel out in the state uh, helping or, or putting on programs. We do not have that in Illinois. So mm-hmm. Iowa is sort of, and I don't think they would say that they're they're not digitally first, but they still have invested a great deal of effort in their field staff. Frankly, I don't, you know, we can talk about that all we want in Illinois. That's not happening here. No. So, you know, uh, it's just simply not happening here. What, you know, you you may get one or two farm management specialists. And that's about it. So um, I think um, that, you know, in, in, in thinking about that, um, there's, you know, almost surprising, though, given the level of success that we've had with FarmDoc, that there haven't been more imitators. I think we've had kind of a unique set of circumstances that have allowed this to grow up here. And it's it's not easy to replicate those factors that I, I just talked about in, in my talk. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that's uh, lack of funds or which part of it is, but I, I really haven't seen anyone try to kind of go all in on the digital model anywhere else yet. Um, like we have here. So that makes it difficult to to control. Uh, okay, uh, there's an interesting one. Uh, how should a doctoral student interested in going into extension demonstrate they are thinking critically about the issues brought up in today's webinar? Very interesting question. Todd, you want to take that one? You're, no, since no, you, since no, you can remember graduate take... school, Gary and I can't, we're too yeah, old. Uh, <laughs> uh... Yeah, I really don't know how to answer that. I, yeah, how would I put this? I, you're an agricultural economist. Agriculture, agricultural economist. That's key, right? Understanding the agricultural sector is key. Um, thinking about issues and going deep in either on markets or farm management or ag finance or ag policy. I think is important and keeping that in forefront. Um, when I'm not, there's not a disconnect between getting a PhD in ag economics and being an extension ag economist. I use stuff I learned in my PhD program all the time. I know, I think sometimes people look at extension differently than they would a research ag economist and that's fine. But, you're still an ag econ- agricultural economist. And I think the digital model itself is just an opportunity for you to have a bigger audience if you can establish it to, you know, um, provide information to people that need it with your training. Um, I worry about ag, econ- ag economics extension in the long run. Um, I think it's still important. And I think there should be more of us at land grant universities, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, one thing I would say is learn how to write, learn how yeah, to write learn well, write. and learn how to say what you have to say in a thousand to fifteen hundred words or less. Or less. Yeah. Wow, I'm an epic failure, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I just think the great advice there to graduate students, the way I would put it, just maybe a little bit differently, is. And this is hard to do in graduate school. And doctoral programs are hard, and but try to stay engaged with what the problems are, what's going on day to day, week to week in uh, agriculture, or if it's not agriculturally oriented, you know, just stay connected to the problems and the conversations that are ongoing. Uh, 
outside of uh, your your office. You know, and I think maintaining some engagement that way is is probably the most important thing you can do because if you get out working in an area, you're you're going to need to just uh, hit the hit the ground running. So I think that makes it easier. Uh, what about the lack of internet access in some rural areas? That's certainly an important infrastructure question, isn't it, Gary? You can come to my uh, living room and have lack of internet services. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, with smartphones and other things, I think that's becoming less and less. But yeah, yeah, if you find areas, I don't know what you do about it. That's hopefully we. I think that that coverage, in the long run, that that's going to solve itself. But, but it is an issue right now. Question came in, said, uh, what are your thoughts about the specific types of issues, topics particularly suited to the strengths of the digital farm doc model and which ones less so? For example, market analysis seems well suited because markets are the same for all audiences. While locally specific analysis may be needed for agronomic pest issues. Great, great observation. What do you, what do you think, Todd, on that one? No, I, that's one of the issues with sort of translating this kind of model into other disciplines in general. Um, I still think it's feasible, uh, and I think Scott's presentation did a good job about, one, the talent, but two, the buy-in, right, and the support. So it's not just that you have the talent. The talent has to buy into doing it, and the department has to support that buy-in. I think there's multiple levels to that. Um, I don't know. I'm not an entomologist, and so thankfully thankfully because i don't know, <laughs> they I study be, insects by I the way study, yeah <laughs> yeah i think you know if you're talking about something like now brown spots have been talked about a lot this year in the corn crop right an article on brown spot anywhere would be read right regardless if you're in illinois iowa nebraska i think that that's that's something that you could do over a wide space I write sometimes about stuff that's more Illinois specific. I know Gary does as well, and sometimes it's not. It just depends on what I'm talking about. I, I, I. That's all I got on that one. You got something else on that? No. Um, said, is there a need for every state extension service to provide market outlook and policy information? I live in Iowa, but regularly access farm doc for such a, such information, mostly using Iowa Extension for crop budgets. Thanks for your good work. We're, Appreciate the uh, the nice comment there. Um, that kind of gets to the idea of potentially yeah. regionalization of, yeah. of of a farm doc style model. Yeah, not every one of those are going to be the same. Uh, extension in Iowa. Iowa has a very strong farm management staff, extension staff, and they're not going to do the same things we do. Um, but I, I don't. So you get, con I get concerned with market and outlook if you think you can do it with one university, you know. Yeah, that bothers me too. Like here at Illinois, we do fundamental analysis, right? And that's what we've done for decades. And I believe in that. And I know you guys do too from our, but somebody might do something else. I mean, I don't think anybody says you only need one trade economist across the Corn Belt to talk about trade issues. No one says you only need one environmental economist. But for some reason, when they talk about market outlook, that comes up. I, I think that's a mistake. Um, right. Um, let's see. Um, are all the contributors PhD ag economists, or are, are they also regional and county agents? Uh, the farm doc team uh, are subject matter specialists. Does ever, is everyone a PhD ag economist? I think so. I've, so, you know, we well, do have someone in ag law. Ag law, we Jonathan Coppas doesn't have a law degree. Ryan you know, Beck, does have a law degree. No, <laughs> <you're not a laughs> I just want to straighten yeah, that out right yeah, now. Right, he supposedly <laughs> has a law degree. <laughs> Jonathan has a law degree, but not a PhD. Um, all of our faculty obviously have PhD. Brian Batts doesn't. Krista Swanson, who works and gets a, a lot of things on here, has a master's degree as well. So uh, the faculty all have PhDs. We've uh, personally, I have uh, made it a point that the contribution the extension in agriculture needs to be faculty level because of what happens when it isn't. 
um, because that faculty level, not that non-faculty level are, can't do it, but faculty at a university are important because they carry the weight in decision making. So the minute you um, make a extension effort non-faculty, you reduce its influence. That's right. It's important to remember that that is actually at the heart of the extension model. That you know we talk about demonstration and other aspects of it, but that the specialist is there to form the core of the effort and the to provide the research, the knowledge base, and the expertise that feeds through the system, whatever model you're using. And so, uh, while you know, I were, wouldn't I make a blanket statement that you know the farm diagnosis always has to have be consist of PhD ag economists. I would see that. For it to remain effective in the long run, the core of that team needs to have that PhD faculty uh, status. You guys agree with that? I do. Yep. All right. So I know we've uh, gone quite a bit over our time. We've gotten to most of the questions. I, I uh, apologize. There's a few that we didn't get to, but we've already gone over time. So say hi to John Noah. Oh, yes, I did see that came in. John, uh, he was one of the first people uh, that helped us very early on. And he asked, he just made a comment. Right? We wanted to say, John, and hope you're doing really well these days. So we want to thank you for our 20 years of Farm Doc, and thank you for tuning in. We hope that this discussion and the presentation has helped you understand what we do in FarmDoc and hopefully it will stimulate some thinking in uh, other places and other uh, extension and land grant and maybe even non-land grant institutions. So thank you very much. And uh, hopefully in another 20 years, we'll be back. Uh, probably not Gary and I, hopefully, uh, but, yeah, but, be back. But, be but, back. But, but, but Todd will be here to uh, assess the next 20 years. But again, sincerely, thank you very much for your time. We value each and every person that has uh, uh, contributed, uh, either by reading and lots of people that have contributed that weren't mentioned in the presentation or comments. And so uh, a huge thank you to everyone. And we're signing off.